Okay, and welcome back. Hour number two. We're going to talk about something this hour that I think many of you saw if you have been watching headlines at Rents.com and elsewhere. At Rents, we try to bring you the most interesting news to consider. Once again, we don't tell you what to think. We just ask you to engage in the process. Now, there were several stories up, and I'll be putting a, a link under Dane's name in a few minutes which has about 10 or 12 on a page, different YouTube stories showing the same thing. And what those YouTube videos show are people who have collected snow and exposed that snow to a direct flame, usually a cigarette lighter. And what happens to that snow shouldn't. It doesn't melt, it gets black, and it tends to burn a little bit. That's not snow. What the hell is it? Well, we're going to find out right now with Dane Wigington, who is certainly the world's foremost outspoken critic of the geoengineering program, which is destroying the atmosphere and much of the planet as well. Hello, Dane, and welcome back. Hello, Jeff. Good to be back, and thanks for your ongoing work toward the common good. My highest regard for that. I'm honored to be able to do it. Uh, you're... Thank you. I, you have looked at the videos. Uh, some of you listening have looked at the videos. This is not snow. Uh, it is not natural. Uh, God only knows what is in it, what is constituting it. It doesn't melt. It tends to burn. What do we have here? We have an artificially chemically nucleated material. And, of course, we see once this data really starts to go viral, and it has, we've seen exactly what we'd expect from mainstream media, the attempt to, quote-unquote, debunk and to have uh, what people perceive as experts, meteorologists, which are really at this point across the board, nothing more than paid disinformation people, almost without exception, try to dispute this. They try to claim that snow always sublimates, meaning it converts from a solid to a gas without passing through a liquid state. If this was the case, would we have rivers that run uh, year round. No rivers, no streams, no lakes, no That's ponds, correct. no moisture. Correct. So, so I mean, it it's a, it's, it's a, to this. I mean, snow does sublimate under certain conditions, and under some conditions it, it, it uh, sublimates significantly, you know, in Gobi Desert type conditions. But in the conditions we see here, where people are melting this over a stove, uh, even aside from the black marks, which some could argue would be the sign of the soot from some of these. Uh, butane burners, which I would not think we would see that much soot in, in that, but even if we let that go, there is no question that this snow is artificially nucleated. We've tested it enough times. There's patents for it. We, we've identified uh, a number of elements in the snow, aluminum, barium, strontium, lead. Uh, we know that in cases of, for example, a positively charged barium particle can nucleate up to 50 degrees. Now, we have some tests that, seem to, we, that show bromide, which is an endothermic reacting material. An endothermic reaction, unlike an exothermic reaction, I know you know this, I'm just explaining to listeners, Jeff, but uh, this is a reaction that absorbs heat and energy, and people can see, in fact, the article I put out on this issue, I put a lab test in of an endothermic reaction where people can see in the case of barium hydroxide and ammonium mixed in a beaker can lower temperatures uh, to extreme uh, levels, in some cases can lower temperatures up to 100 degrees almost instantly, so... Huh. I mean, these chemicals exist. The patents exist. We had mm -hmm. mainstream media cover Chinese artificial nucleation of snowstorms. People can Google this. Google engineered snowstorms. Google Chinese scientists engineered snowstorms. So there's no question it's going on, Jeff. And if people in some areas find their snow didn't melt in the same manner, why would we expect that it would be uniform across the globe? Certainly natural snow didn't disappear, or certainly the chemical mix is not going to be uniform across the planet. So the fact that some people have had some tests that seem to not behave in the same way, why would we be surprised that this is an ongoing experiment and every place isn't going to have the same level of saturation? Now, you said you've identified barium, aluminum, lead, and other things. Now, you have actually already had people take this chemically nucleated snow and do those tests? We've had tests in previous nucleated events. In fact, some of ah. our tests are from a nucleated event in Northern California, which was the last go-around. Now, interestingly enough, and this is the point I want to stress with people, we know this is an ongoing experiment, and those conducting the experiment are likely to change, so or to change their uh, applications. 
So the last snow we had in Northern California was completely different in composition than the previous three years. Instead of the heavy, wet snow, we had what was almost like a powder, like almost a talc powder that uh, had almost no moisture in it at all. Huh. And it was it was so markedly different that it was, uh, you know, it, it was quite astonishing. Almost and, no. Now, I've always known that snow always contains varying amounts of moisture. It's It's correct. not uniform. But what we're seeing here is ludicrous, and it, it's not the not the entire east. All the places that were snowed on didn't have this. Now the questions that begin to flow immediately are: Was this material that chemically nucleated the snow and caused it to fall already up there, or were they spraying above the storm in order to try to precipitate more snow, or whatever they were doing? Uh, do you think it was already hanging up in the air and being pushed ahead of the storm front and, and enveloped by it, and then it just actually did its thing, uh, more or less as a random event, or was it planned? Uh, I I believe absolutely the latter. That this because it, it, being outside a number of these events, which I have been through the entire event, all we can hear in the Pacific Northwest when they're nucleating a storm, all we can hear is aircraft. One after another, after another, after another. And even during daytime hours when you could correlate the precipitation with some sort of time frame from when aircraft have been uh, heard in, in significant quantity overhead uh-huh. and these flakes uh-huh. start coming down, it definitely appears to be a disbursement that's occurring over the storms right. at the time the storms are enveloping. We also right. have an image of a stripe of snow across the, about a 20-mile valley that certainly would indicate that was a disbursement, that the whole valley is snow-free except one stripe. So that can't not be a disbursement <laughs> one, that occurred one overhead. One stripe. Follow me? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's certainly yeah. happening overhead at that time, uh-huh. and uh, I, I don't think there's there's any getting around that. Also, a point I wanted to mention, Jeff, and I, I try to take in data all day from every source I can. Today on Weather Channel, they made a point repeatedly throughout the day. Weather Channel's job is to make the completely unnatural seem natural. That's, uh, that's sure, you know, they're, they're paid actors. So they said repeatedly today, referring to the snow that's going to be falling along the East Coast in the coming days, uh-huh. this snow will be heavy, wet snow, not the kind of snow we had in January. What does that mean? We have a snow for every month now, or they, they switch gears, uh, and, and they know that this snow was going to be a totally different composition. How could they know that? And why would they make it a point to state it? Wow. As, as the experiment changed again, but that's a direct yeah, quote. Yeah. wrote it right down at the time. This snow will be heavy, wet snow, not the kind of snow we had in January. The chemically nucleated snow. This is really getting to be embarrassing. Uh, and I, I said this years ago. Operation Northwoods talked about the CIA bragging. It controlled all the major newspaper media in the 1950s, early 1960s, and could place any story that they, the controllers, the CIA, wanted in any paper within an hour anywhere they want. Now, that's before the age of mass media electronics and instantaneous con- control and communication. They can do anything they want now. Any major voice, whether it be in the mainstream media or, I'm sorry to say, in the alternative media, not all of them, but many of them, are compromised, they are assets, they are agents, they're running an agenda, and you've got to keep that in mind. I can assure you there are very few truly independent voices left out there. Now, there are people who are trying to do the right thing. Many of them are driven by ego, uh, the lust for celebrity that pushes many people into all kinds of different publicly viewable platforms, and certainly the Internet is an easy way to go. Uh, you can pick up good information from them. But there are agents everywhere, taxpayer-supported, government intel, NSA, CIA, you name it. Big corporations have their people working the Internet all the time. They lurk on forums, on, on blogs. They cause fights. They start disinformation, defamation, libel. You name it, and they do it. The Internet is a jungle out there, so you've got to be careful. But in all of the noise is the truth. You can find it. It's there, and you're hearing it from Dane right now. Uh, the, the idea that this stuff was sprayed at the time of the storms, very interesting. But let me go back. This material, the aluminum and barium, 
uh, does tend to fall out of the sky. However, if it is nano-sized, Dane, it can hang up there for a considerable length of time, can it? It can, and I don't mean to insinuate that's the only spraying going on. I'm sorry I did make it sound like that. That's not what I mean. Certainly they're spraying before the storms, during the storms. But, but there does seem to be a significant uh -huh. additional application during I noticed the one effort to debunk came out uh, rather quickly as soon as the videos began to make their way around the net. Pretty obvious what, uh, what was going on there. Okay, they're not there yet, but they will be shortly. Uh, I think I've got one or two up still in headlines about the snow, so we'll get to that in a second. Okay, these major Arctic blasts, the Arctic vortex, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how do you read those uh, in terms of the overall picture, Dane? Did this surprise you this winter? I don't, I don't know that they're engineered. They may be a, a byproduct of uh, the constant plying of the skies back and forth and pouring all kinds of chemicals into the skies at the nano size and up. What do you make of it? Actually, I believe they're completely engineered. And what you mentioned before the show very, very accurately an important point that a lot of even the quote-unquote independent news sites are putting out what amounts to disinformation. And what's, what's alarming to me is even some of these sites who claim to be anti-geoengineering activists, if you will, then cite these weather events as being natural. We have a system that's completely disrupted at this point. From top to bottom, there is no natural weather. Even if you had small-scale geoengineering programs going on that has the potential to disrupt the entire system, but we know we have global climate engineering going on, even by opposing powers, China and Russia on one side of the fence, NATO countries on the other. So at this point, the anomalies we're seeing are so unprecedented that I think it's impossible not to conclude that, that there is no natural weather. So in the case of the Arctic blasts, the, the polar vortexes, we see stationary ridge of high pressure over the west which we have enough satellite imagery to make clear the oh. unnatural nature of that. I, I tracked it since uh, late October, through October, November, December. I put up uh, one or two stories showing a progression over a couple of weeks. This enormous high-pressure ridge, like a brick wall, and the storms were coming out of the Pacific Northwest corner, if you look at a satellite picture, moving to the east, and they would, it, real vigorous weather systems, and they'd run into this thing, and they'd sit there, and it's like somebody took a sponge and wrung them out and to turn them into globs and pieces of moisture, most of which would end up being pushed up into the uh, British Columbia, Canada area by the clockwise rotation of this enormous ridge of high pressure. It would push them up into Canada, across a couple of provinces, and down right into the Midwest. There you go. And I think one of the, art, one of the the better articles, or the best articles, was put out by you. In fact, you had a lot of good satellite images on that article, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so yeah, exactly yeah. what you put uh, in that article is exactly what's happening. So this stationary ridge of high pressure pumps from a, a very low dip in the eastern Pacific, picks up moisture, pumps it north clockwise, as you correctly stated, around the high pressure, like a, like a giant pulley, pulls it back down into the U.S. where it's being sprayed the whole time, and that's cooling that air mass down. So you know, as you corrected me, and, you know, I, I made an unclear point that this nucleation takes uh, is taking place right above the storm as it's occurring, but the storms are also being sprayed in, through their entire progression, which helps migrate that moisture, huh. which helps cool the air mass. It's all part of a long, intricate process. But So that, that rotating wheel uh, has rotated this warmer air through Alaska. By yeah. the way, Alaska just had the warmest January on record. Huh. Uh, some listed as a tie for the record, others as the warmest. We had temperatures in Alaska of almost 70 degrees while it was snowing in Florida. So, I mean, the degree to which the system is being pulled apart should be apparent. So that spins, again, down into the lower 48. They pump this cold air south. They push moisture up from the Gulf of Mexico. Since when do winter storms happen with moisture from the Gulf of Mexico? They combine the two. You have a, a transition zone of ice storm between the warmer subtropical moisture, which has thunderstorms and, and tornadoes, you have a transition zone again of ice storm. Then you have where the, enough saturation is occurring and it's starting to uh, be frozen precipitation. 